Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. If you're listening to this in real time, we would like to wish you a happy 2021. We're all excited more than ever for the expectations, um, hopefully, of a different kind of year uh, than what we've had the last year. So from us to you, let me wish you health and prosperity in this new year. Today, we are starting our discussion of a great political classic. Uh, Although it's not contemporary politics, today we want to jump back to the Renaissance and uh, explore the political realities of Florence as they existed in the late 1490s and early 1500s through the eyes of Niccolo Machiavelli and his political handbook, The Prince. Christy, how should we begin this book? And really, why should we even read it? Well, you know, that's a really interesting question because everyone, if you go to school long enough, will be made to read this book. I read it my first semester in college because at the time, I, well, I did major in political science, and it was the first book we ever read in the intro to poli sci. My youngest daughter took AP European history as a sophomore, and she was required to read it. My oldest daughter was required to read it for a business class her junior year of college, and today I require, in fact, as we speak, my students are reading it right now (laughs) in AP language. So look how many different disciplines, history and business and, uh, and language, that people are exploring this book. That's just my immediate family, by the way. I could go on. (laughs) Well, you're also in company with celebrities from uh, Tupac (laughs) to Henry VIII. They they all have studied this book. Uh, And yet the word Machiavelli or Machiavellian has such negative connotations. It's a popular word that has uh, seeped into our vernacular and it it comes out in such diverse contexts like... um, the cartoon, Bart Simpson, Simpson Family, or the teen movie, The Princess Diaries. Western, I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, Western culture has adopted his name to really symbolize treachery. Many movie characters and novel characters um, use what we perceive as his uh, essence as a model. I even saw an article in the BBC uh, that called uh, 10 of Popular Culture's Best Machiavellian Characters. And when I looked at the f- list... There were no good guys. Oh, no. In fact, the term Old Nick uh, is a common euphemism for the devil himself. It's fair to, I mean, is it really fair to codify him as the paragon of evil? Well, you know, I don't feel that way about him. I like him. And if you go to our website, and you can see that I've had my picture taken with him in in the... (laughs) With him, wow. Well, with his statue outside the Uffizi in Florence, as well as in front of his grave there at the Basilica of Santa Croce. I think there really is a lot to admire about this man who really does try to be honest about the world as he saw it, and I've always appreciated that. For me, his book is a leadership handbook. Uh, Maybe if you want to think of it as how to be a tyrant, that's definitely true. And as such, it could be a warning label of things to look for. You might be talking to a tyrant if, and then you could let Machiavelli fill in the blanks for you, Jeff Foxworthy style with those characteristics mm, that would define what a combination. it. I know. But the problem for me was when I was assigned to read this book as a 17 year old college freshman, I had no idea what I was reading. I been to Rome for three days as a 13-year-old. That was pretty cool because my family had been living in Zimbabwe and we were flying home, but I didn't know anything about Italy, the Renaissance, or any of the multiple references in this book. I mean, I I remembered who Moses was and Romulus, but that's as close as I got to understanding the things he was trying to explain. I just didn't understand his examples. So that's where I want us to start, because if he has anything to say to our modern world, which I really do think he does, we have to know enough about his world to be able to track with him, which was my problem when I read it for the first time. I just couldn't. And uncovering anything Italian is an entanglement uh, through many, many layers of historical discovery. There's so much. If you take a tour of Italy in any major city, uh, but let's use Rome as an example, 
the absolute first thing the tour guide will tell you is that the land tells thousands of stories the deeper that you dig. If you go to the middle of old Rome, you can stand on the steps of the Victor Emmanuel Monument, which is this um, huge and beautiful monument built in 1911. And you can turn to your right and see almost uh, the entirety of the Rome, Roman Forum and the Colosseum. And then to your left, you see the top of St. Peter's Cathedral at the Vatican. And there's 2,000 years of culture visible above ground. And of course, as you look around, there are endless excavations of archaeologists and historians going underground to unearth um, even more secrets of the past. And I'm sure there are other places with such visible reminders of the expansive nature of the history of man, but not many that are so visibly obvious. Well, that's absolutely true. And I think that's part of what is so charming about so many things distinctly Italian. And of course, Italy is charming. There's the wine and the leather, the cars, the soccer team. Never mind the art. They had a little bit of art. <laughs> and in some sense, Nicchio Machiavelli, although every bit a part of this heritage, doesn't seem to have had much interest at all in the beautiful parts of life that today we associate, or at least I'll speak for myself, I associate with Italy. He was such a serious dude. But before we get into him in particular, I do think it's nice to explain for just a minute a little bit about the geography of Italy. I know most of us understand it, but just to have it in our mind, you know, we know that Italy looks like a boot. And if you didn't know that, we do have a PowerPoint on our website that we use with students that you can take a look at. And this is an oversimplification, but it's nice to have in your mind this mental image of Italy as you try to read the story. Now, you can start off with Sicily down in the bottom, and that's the land we think of here in America as being connected to the Godfathers, or at least the Godfather movie. And it's literally underneath the toe of the boot. Then you have Rome smack dab in the middle, and of course, that's where the Vatican is. And then we have the north, and the north is the glamorous part. <laughs> that's where we have all the fancy vineyards of Florence and Tuscany, the wine country. And then there's Venice, the city with all the canals. And then there's Milan with all the fashion models. And then there's Pisa, where you can see the leaning tower and get your picture trying to hold it up. And of course, there's Verona that we've already talked about with Juliet and her balcony. And you know, all of these places pretty much are referenced in The Prince, except at that time, and, and this was something I didn't understand for a long time either, Italy wasn't a country. It wasn't unified. They were all little bitty countries, if you want to think of it that way. And the aggressive drama referenced in the book has to do with the back and forth of each of these little empires. So Gary, tell us about the Italian Renaissance. I know Renaissance is much bigger than that, but let's confine our discussion to the Italian version. So how much time do we have? I know, one, um, like five minutes. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Uh, well, we can't afford to spend too much time there, right? but we do want to give one little background. I want to point out one little side note. Um, at this current time in world history, you see uh, the monarchies of Europe developing and centralizing government, but Italy is very different. They had this separate city-state, and that was their, uh, their foundation. Uh, and what we need to really understand is how Machiavelli is really a, a very much a product of, of the Italian Renaissance, even if he didn't have an interest in art, like we most usually associate with the Italian Renaissance. Um, it, it is one of those times in history of Italy, anyway, where there was this paradigm shift in how people we're looking at the world. Major historical movements like this have happened all over the world for various reasons. And the term Renaissance has been used to represent many different occasions. But in the Italian case, there is a move toward what today we call Italian humanism. Um, Italians were thinking more individualistically. They were trying to go back to their own cultural roots, to their classical roots. They were interested in the Romans like we think of with Julius Caesar and the sculptures of the Roman Empire, but more importantly, at least for Machiavelli, they were interested in the Greeks, how they were organizing the world, organizing themselves. And Machiavelli spent a lot of time in the later years of his life really trying to sort all of this out. Uh, there is this famous quote by Machiavelli where he says, and this is later in life when he's in exile and he's in his writing phase, but he says this, when evening comes... I return home, go into my study, 
On a threshold, I strip off my muddy, sweaty workday clothes and put on the robes of court and palace. And in this graver dress, I enter the antique courts of the ancients and am welcomed by them. And there I taste the food that alone is mine and for which I was born. And there I make bold to speak to them and ask the motives of their actions. And they, in their humanity, reply to me. And for the space of four hours, I forget the world, remember no vexation, fear poverty no more, tremble no more at death. I pass indeed into their world. Well, it's nice. And and I have to respect his understanding that reading literature and thought from the past is valuable. and, And it is kind of like a conversation with the ancients. But when he talks about ancients, I assume he's referencing the Greeks. That's it exactly. I mean, Machiavelli had benefited from the emphasis in Florence in building universities and, and places for middle class people like him to really delve into philosophical discourse. Uh, Florence had the first library, at least in the Western world, and he had access not just to a personal collection of books, but works the Medici family had collected. That was the works of Aristotle and Plato, uh, things that had been translated into Latin from Greek, and Machiavelli was very well-versed in Latin. He had uh, received a classical education, and all the most educated people had, and he was highly educated, although not a person of noble birth uh, because his father had been a lawyer. But it's interesting to understand that history is the story of the people who took the most time and energy to keep good records, and the Florentines were good at documenting. Today, lots of what we know about the Italian Renaissance has much to do with Florence. Yes, because they were patrons of the arts and all that, but mostly because Florence is one of the late medieval Europe's most well-documented cities. Machiavelli is a part of that. He wrote things down. Well, of course, uh, most of us are familiar with the big names, like the Ninja Turtle names. I was getting ready to say <laughs> This sounds like the Ninja Turtles. I know. Uh, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, but then there's Botticelli, and of course, Brunelleschi, who is famous for building the famous dome that reminds you that you're in Florence when you see it. And of course, the famous Medici family that not only made Florence one of the wealthiest cities in Italy and paid for a lot of the art, but they eventually influenced all of Italy and were to have four members of their family serve as popes. Not to mention my favorite, Catherine de' Medici. <laughs> she comes on along later, but she lived in France. And okay, I got that from Netflix, the show Rain. Uh, and she, by the way, is the most Machiavellian character on that show. <laughs> but it's a name reference. Indeed. But interestingly enough, Machiavelli was surrounded by all these beautiful things that the world has been celebrating for hundreds of years. But he had no interest in that part of it. Machiavelli was interested in who was controlling what, how they got their power, and what made them lose it. Italy's greatest strength at this time was the uh, vigorously independent city-states, uh, Venice and Milan, the Papal State, Naples, um, and Florence's, Florence. There were alliances and rivalries and wars, and, and among these, Florence distinguished itself. Florence was a republic and had been for hundreds of years, which is something very unusual. Uh, And the people there were extremely proud of this. All the other city-states, except for Venice, were led by families, but not Florence, although by Machiavelli's time, they were actually were only Republican name only, and the Medicis, the corporate people, were (laughs) running the show. Inevitable. They experienced what Machiavelli calls liberté. They had liberty and freedom from rulers controlling them. They had agency. Uh, in Florence, property-holding males could participate in government. But, as in all things human, conspiracies and corruption erupted. Most infamously, the Pazzi conspiracy that tried to murder Lorenzo Medici and did murder his brother, Uh, But there were other incidences, too. Machiavelli not only witnessed these, but he was a victim of this kind of instability. He witnessed how fickle loyalties could be. Uh, He would have seen public executions. 
He himself was tortured when his name was found on a list of names in a conspirator's pocket and accused of trying to overthrow the Medici's. And Machiavelli was accused of being involved in the coup. And although I'm not sure that wasn't fake news. (laughs) Who would know? (laughs) Machiavelli had gotten his first big job working for the Republic after Piero Medici lost power. And he was good at this kind of life. He started as a uh, junior secretary who was really an effective diplomat. But over the 13 years that he worked for the Republic, he got really good at his job. He also met all the big names in the power circles of his day. He made deals with popes and the king of France and the king of Spain. He was the center of those deals. And he watched these powerful men. And he saw through the tactics of many popes and other warriors He paid attention to what they said in private versus what they said in public, and he watched how they used religion, something that was so important in medieval Europe, He how that was used to manipulate people. He watched how they used violence and fear and deceit and all the things you weren't ever supposed to do or even mention. But because he was watching the powerful as one who was around it but never actually having the power, He observed how things really worked. He paid attention to the differences in what people did versus what people morally ought to do and what they said they were doing. Uh, And these are the experiences that created the mindset that we're going to see in The Prince. He is unendingly pragmatic about observing human behavior. He's a psychological researcher (laughs) in the field of studying power in this time period. Well, he pretty much tells the reader... You know, a lot of this in the preface, and he says he's trying to set up a handbook for a new ruler, and he sets the scene as he describes it to actually be the exact scene or the stage that the new Lorenzo was walking into as he returned to lead Florence as a new prince. He had little experience and no established trust, and this is his instruction manual, a manual to show somebody new how they could effectively lead like a veteran who did have experience as well as an established reputation. Yes. um, This book is basically a job application to try to get a position in the Medici regime, Uh, something others who had worked for the Republic had been able to successfully do, but not him. He's trying to say, you need me. (laughs) Machiavelli is a hustler, and he wants to show the Medicis what he can do for them. Yes, and I really love how open he is about this. He says that many people, to win the favor of the prince, give elaborate gifts. And he only had one thing to offer, but it was an elaborate gift. And it was his, and I quote, knowledge of the actions of great men, which I have learned by long experience in modern affairs and a continuous study of ancient matters, which I have thought through with great effort and subjected to great scrutiny. And I believe he was doing exactly this. One of the reasons is this book is written in Italian. Now, you think, duh, he's in Italy. But people weren't doing that. The things that were to last and were to be gone across Europe were written in Latin. This book wasn't written for posterity or for theories. It was written as a practical handbook. And he never published it. It wasn't published until after he died although he did circulate it among the leadership in his world, it's extremely straightforward to the point that it almost feels conversational. It's not a political science theory book. He makes a claim, and then he gives examples, both from antiquity, maybe things that people have studied, or at least he had studied, but then of recognizable events that the people in his world would have known. And then he explains the connection. What does this mean? What do these concepts from the antiques have to do with today and the events that they knew about firsthand? A couple of times, he references literal personal conversations that he had with the Pope and other power brokers. Of course, For us, some of this is lost because the difficulty in understanding his examples. But for the people of his day, they're obvious. People have criticized him over the years, saying that the prince isn't scholarly enough, that his examples are anecdotal. But he uses the same strategy we all use when we're trying to 
explain something complicated to a friend or a coworker. For example, in chapter two, he's going to say this. If you inherit a kingdom, you only have to be mediocre <laughs> and not screw things up if you inherit it. Then he goes on to say, we have one of those guys. Do you know the old Duke of Ferrara? Now, of course, I'm using my vernacular. Just kind of show you yeah. what he's trying to do. Uh, but this is a situation that the people that he know, oh, yeah, the Duke. You know, this is kind of how he goes all the way through the book. There's lots of examples that are contemporary, but there are also others uh, from history, Greek history, Roman history, biblical history. And he's really using his examples to demonstrate ideas that he has, to demonstrate competence and a skill. Uh, and the skill that he's calling out is the way that people actually behave. What are they doing? Say out loud the things that lots of people in those circles of power, we would say like the smoke filled committee rooms, what are they saying in private? The deals that they are cutting, the experiences that he had in those places, he wants to now expose how the back rooms actually work. Machiavelli absolutely believed that although people change culturally, behaviorally, they do not change. Do you well, agree with that? 2,000%. <laughs> uh, the things that were motivating the ancients were motivating his contemporaries. Uh, and if he's right in this, it's what is motivating people to this current day. I think it's a brilliant observation. It's an archetypal study of human behavior, and there's genius in it. Well, there are 26 small chapters of such genius, and they're basically tips. All of the chapter titles are actually in Latin because he was quite good at Latin, and there's lots of little Latin quotes. But the tone, the style, everything about this is about knowing what to do now if you're in a current situation as the leader, not what we should be doing in the future generations, which is kind of ironic because sadly for him, he was never getting back into those power circles to show us in real time these ideas because he didn't get the job, poor thing, with the Medicis. In fact, by the time he died, most people did not know him for his political genius at all, but for perhaps some of the raunchy sex comedies he'd been writing to try to finance his life in those later days. Poor guy, mm. he'd been reduced. <laughs> yeah, so that's likely oh, not his proudest no, moment. Oh, poor thing. But fortunately for us, uh, he did spend most of those remainder of his days that he was in exile talking to those ancients from that quote that you read, hanging out with them, reading and contemplating everything that had happened to him for the 12 glory years that he had worked for the Florentine government. And I know it's easy to see. It's it's probably true that a little bit of the book is indeed sour grapes because uh, he's the one that was the victim of fortune, a term that we'll talk about next week, but he uses, you know, very specifically throughout the book. Well, the prince and the, the sex comedies weren't the only things that he wrote. Oh, no, you're right. He wrote quite a lot of other things, and lots of them are very impressive. He wrote letters. He wrote a much longer political work called The Discourses on Livy, the famous Roman historian, and, and lots of other things, too. But, of course, it's the prince that went viral, and it did. It went globally viral. It was published in 1532. By 1559, now... That doesn't seem, I mean, that's not a long time, especially if you think about the ancient world. But by then, it was already placed on the index of prohibited books. A and banned book. Banned book. And the Inquisition, we talked about that uh, earlier in our Our Town series, decreed the utter destruction of all Machiavelli's works. However, that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, there were Latin translations, French translations, English translations. We know that in Shakespeare's play, The Merry Wives of Windsor, Shakespeare has one of his characters say, Am I subtle? Am I a Machiavel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we know that within 75 years, uh, Machiavelli's name was a commonly used phrase with lots of people who had badmouthed him, but also with others who defended him. 
Francis Bacon, actually a contemporary, said without disapproval that Machiavelli dealt with men as they are, not as they ought to be. And I have a sign uh, that I've always kept up that says, politics is the art of masking your true intentions. That's my own quote, by the way. <laughs> I was going to say, where'd you get that? <laughs> yeah. Machiavelli looked straight past those masking behaviors, and he exposed true intentions in politics. Which, that seems crazy in a day, you know, the idea of something going viral without the internet or TV or even radio. It was the power of his ideas that were exploding, and people wanted to read it, and they found a way to get it. Yeah, well, it did go viral, just a lot slower than it would <laughs> today. Well, that's part of it, but another part of it also has a bit to do with bad luck again. After his book was first printed, um, it was well-received, actually. And in 1576, shortly after the massacre of the Protestants in France, Christy, you may remember that from Rain. Oh, yes. Um, a man called Innocent Gentilet called the anti-Machiavelli and denounced Machiavelli as murderous. And this kind of took off and he got labeled as a villain. And Shakespeare was possibly familiar uh, with that label because he used the term Machiavelli in more than one play. Poor Mac. Let me tell you. <laughs> he, he lost control of his brand. <laughs> he did. He, that's exactly what he did. Uh, but before, And he would have probably had thoughts about that, but he wasn't around to defend himself. Anyway, to get back on track, let's talk about how the book is organized. I told you it's organized in 26 very short chapters. The first 11 chapters, this is what we'll talk about next week, is really about 40% of the text and presents the different kinds of kingdoms and how they're acquired. The next 10 chapters talk about what the different kinds of kingdoms are and the specific challenges relating to each of the different kinds. And the remaining chapters offer advice on how a prince should behave and how he needed to behave in order to preserve his reputation. There are really four big themes that drive this book, and they're going to come out over and over again as he fleshes out how these themes or these ideas are going to apply to all these different situations. The first large point, which we've been making over and over again, is that you must absolutely be honest with what we see, how we interpret and understand the world. There is no point in wanting the world to be how you want it. People are not going to do the right thing. There are just realities. And it's just so easy for us not to want to be honest about that fact. Secondly, there is power in individuals, agency, and the choices that they make. Even if fortune or fate exists, and he's going to assume that it does, and he will define it, sometimes they can't be controlled, but there's things that you can do. There is power in the individual. There is virtue, and he's going to define virtue. I found this interesting. We'll talk about it next week. As kind of courage or the stereotypical manliness, if you want to think of it that way, even though that word might not resonate very well anymore. But he explains that there are realities that are different in the exercise of power. And if your goal is to preserve the state, and by state he means the state that you're in charge of, but also your state of leadership in it, if you want to slipify it down to that, there's things that you should do. And finally, he's going to, and this is going to run through the whole book too, there always has been and there always will be instability in the world. And of course, this applies to all human organizations, political organizations, social organizations, commercial or even ecclesiastical organizations. They're just unstable. We as humans do not make stable entities. Are you suggesting that Machiavelli would not believe in utopian societies? Uh, no. <laughs> he is the anti-utopian. He is. I love the quote, uh, this quote, the way one ought to live is so far from how one does live that anyone who leaves behind what one does for what one ought to do comes to understand his own ruin rather than his preservation. And of course, by ruin, he means loss of power. Yes, and I totally understand what he means by this. But so many of us would rather just not think in those terms because we're good people. And in fact, even in Machiavelli's day, almost all of the leadership books were writing and working off the premise that man is fundamentally good 
and a good leader is somebody who is morally good. But Machiavelli just doesn't see the world working out that way in real time. I know a young man, actually, he's not young anymore, but when I knew him, he was. And he was a great guy, actually. At the time, he was about 23, 23 years old, and he had moved to Brazil to do missionary work. He was very idealistic and very good-hearted. He had left his home country to serve the downtrodden of Serra, Brazil, where we lived at the time. Well, this young man lived next to an empty lot, just your average urban lot, and with every ounce of goodwill, he put up a basketball goal there, which was great, but I'll never forget it. He had been there about a week, and he bought a basketball, and he took it to the park, and he wrote a note, and he taped it to the pole, and he left the basketball right under the pole. And he said this, although I paraphrase because I can't remember the exact wording anymore, but he said something like this, I'm leaving this basketball here for anyone to play with, so we can all enjoy the park. Please play all you want, but leave the ball here for the next person. Gary, from what you know about human behavior, what do you think happened? (laughs) I think it took about 15 (laughs) seconds for that ball to be stolen. (laughs) That ball was gone. Yes, it didn't make it through the first day, although I'm not sure we have testimonial evidence as to the number of seconds it required. (laughs) But Machiavelli would have told you, you just can't think like that. That's the thinking about how we wish the world operated, but not operating under the realities that actually exist in it. And that is the line of reasoning Machiavelli is trying to get his reader to apply over and over again and take to heart. And to me, this is how this book immediately becomes very practical. Of course, no one listening to this podcast is likely a monarch with a kingdom. (laughs) But everything in the book has a practical application in the way we live our lives. Because whether we think of it or not, we are often princes. We just don't use that kind of language. Uh, If you read the first sentence in chapter one, uh, well, let me read it and then I'll explain what I mean. It says this, all states and dominions which hold and have held sway over mankind are either republics or monarchies. Well, he says this, all states and dominions are either republics and monarchies. So that's archaic language. We don't have that kind of stuff anymore. But what does it mean? It means that leaders are either selected from the bottom up from the group or they're chosen from the top down. In chapter two, he's going to say this book is not about republics. He's throwing all that out because he's saying that's not your situation. But then he goes on to subdivide the second category, this monarchy category, into hereditary mar- monarchs. And that's, he's going like, to explain what that is. And that's when we can see a little bit about how we could apply it. Because one of those leaders, he's going to say, if you inherit the monarchy, you're heir to the throne, and you're operating in, as, under different rules from somebody who is a new monarch or newly founded monarch so uh make this practical what would a newly founded monarch look like today right and that's where i say switch out the word monarch and put in leader it's leadership that comes from the outside as opposed as leadership that has been developed from the inside I'll give you a real practical point. Okay, last year, the vice principal of my school left. Now, I teach at the largest high school in the state of Tennessee, and that makes for us, this is a very important position. The person who is the vice president, basically vice president, vice principal, basically oversees everything. Well, our vice principal left, and he was really good at his job, and he was beloved. And so there was panic. Who was going to replace him? Well, if the job had gone to an underling, an assistant principal who we already knew, who this guy had been grooming, he would have been a hereditary monarch. That's what I mean. He's a leader that's kind of inherited that position. We, if that were the case, we would have known the guy. We would have known what to expect. We would assume that he would keep the status quo, all the alliances that had been formed. And yes, high schools have alliances. Lots of drama. <laughs> oh my goodness. We would have been comfortable. The people who were running the show would assume that under the new management, everything would stay the same. Machiavelli tells us, and I believe that this is true, a guy like that has it pretty easy. Right. He doesn't have to be that awesome. He just has to be somewhat good at his job. And 
uh, it would take, uh, in Machiavelli's words, extraordinary vices to make him hated. Um, it's only reasonable for his subject to be naturally already attached to him. In Europe, during uh, the Napoleonic Wars, nationalism and attachments to national governments really developed because groups of people wanted to be deliberately known as not French. <laughs> that was their main motivation for identifying as a group. But that's not what happened to us. We got a new prince, just like Florence did. And according to Machiavelli, being a new prince is tricky for reasons that are fairly obvious if you think about it that way. Machiavelli warns that someone like this will find enemies in the people who were benefiting from the previous system. He lays all this out and he proceeds to give advice on things that most certainly will bring you to ruin. And then he's going to give you advice about things that, you know, he doesn't ever guarantee success, but he says these are things that could actually help your leadership go over a point that he's going to make. You don't have to be loved necessarily, but you do have to be feared or respected if you want to kind of look at those words as the same, but you have to avoid being hated. Always good. So in Machiavelli terms, let me give you an example from the business world of what a new prince would look like. A few years ago, my brother, who is a businessman, took a job as a fairly high-level manager at a generator manufacturing company here in town. But he came in to this company as an outsider from a different company completely. No one at the company knew him from the man off the street. So when he came in, he was up against all the problems that Machiavelli is going to outline here in the beginning of the book. Uh, all the people who were benefiting from the previous way the business was being run were at risk. The problem was that the upper management was unhappy with how things were being run. The previous management had run the company basically into the ground and the company was struggling and it needed a new monarch. So they brought one in. Machiavelli style. Dear Tim, my brother. <laughs> well, I don't know if my brother's ever read The Prince. I haven't asked him. But the first thing he did when he went there was actually one of the recommendations that Machiavelli advises in the third chapter of his book. In chapter three of the book, he says that if a new monarch needs to colonize a new place, which was basically what was happening, the best thing he could do is to move there. Well, Tim, that's my brother's name, needed to colonize a new place. So instead of taking the corner office, the pretty office, and the headquarters building that was far away from the manufacturing plant, he found an old grubby office space smack dab in the middle of the plant, and he managed from there, from within. Machiavelli says, when you do this, you're able to avert disorder. And this was actually my brother's experience. It went well. Tim was able to do that. Machiavelli learned the same thing, and he's going to give examples from the Romans and from the Greeks and from the Macedonians. And Machiavelli is going to say that disorders are like fevers. They're hard to see at the beginning, but they're easy to cure if they're detected and treated. But if they go on too long, they're easy to see, but by that point, they're impossible to cure. So if you can understand what I'm saying, that's the way to read the book. Look for the parallels. How am I a prince? If I take out the word and put in leader, does that help me understand the tips that will make this book suddenly very practical? Um, that's all well, <laughs> except when he gets into the part about killing people and lying and pretending to be something that you're not, the other Machiavellian traits. Well, true. <laughs> Especially in the second half of the book, it gets kind of interesting. But even that, you know, today we don't kill people literally, but we cancel them and we kill them in the way that we kill in our modern world. So in one sense, we can read this book as a way to implement leadership principles for ourselves as unsavory as some of these examples actually are. Uh, but if you want to be a tyrant... They do work. <laughs> Proven. <laughs> There's no doubt of that. But it goes farther than that. And I will say, this is the controversial part. He eventually goes far as to say, honestly, because people aren't honest. You have to be ready if you want to lead or win, if you want to see it that way, to 
not play by the rules. Because if you choose to play by the rules, there's certain games that you will lose. And power is one of those games. And this is something we see all the time in modern politics, or at least that's how it looks. Machiavelli is saying that your enemies are going to want you to play by the rules, but they're not going to. They're going to cheat. And assuming you play the by the rules, they will always beat you. It's kind of like this. I'm going to insist, Gary, that you always follow the speed limit so that when I drive, I can always break the speed limit and I know I'll be able to get ahead. Machiavelli is going to say that's going to happen every time because that's how people operate. So you have to decide, are you going to be a person who follows all the rules or are you going to make these decisions that may or may not be, you know, well, they're morally relative is the term we use, but the idea is it's actually morally right to break the speed limit in order to compete with the people who are breaking the speed limit. And if I always take the moral high ground, I'll never win. It, it's a very controversial moral conundrum. Well, it, it, it absolutely is. And it's a real world political problem that's been around since the beginning. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau read The Prince as kind of a critical expose of poor leadership um, as a kind of warning to citizens that these are methods ambitious people use to manipulate you. And, and I know the more scandalous pieces of advice are later on in the book, and we'll get to them in the next couple of weeks. But for me, uh, this is what makes the book interesting on so many levels. Um, is the book a handbook? Is it a satire? Is it an expose? I mean, it's been called all three of those things. And really, it seems the answer is yes, yes, and yes. True. And that's certainly how I enjoy reading it. You know, in my little world as a classroom teacher, I absolutely benefit from keeping in mind that I need to be feared and not loved mm -hmm. if I'm going to be effective in my little princedom and my little role. But I'm going to flip it. And as my role as a citizen of the United States, I've learned to be very, very skeptical of this parade of political leaders that every four years show up in church trying to appear religious, exactly like Machiavelli says they're bound to do. So what's the trick to enjoying the book? To me, you have to see yourself as both prince and citizen. And you have to take the principles and think about them. What does it mean really to be an honorable leader? Machiavelli will tell you that all princes should pursue and keep their state. In other words, they should keep their state of leadership, but they need to keep the state, like take care of the people that they're entitled to take care of. And he's going to say that if you do this properly, there's glory in that. And it's something to think about and wonder to what degree do we go with him. Uh, our, and it's also something to think about when we look at the people in our world that are leading us and we have to think, are we being duped by an inglorious prince? <laughs> <laughs> Always. Well, in, in one last compliment I want to give Machiavelli here uh, as we wind things up. One of the great things about clinical psychology is that a good clinical psychologist does one thing. He knows that you come to see him or her with a presenting self and an authentic self and it's his job or her job to get to the authentic self and not be not be sent off in different directions by the presenting self. That's in a microcosm what um, Machiavelli is doing right here. Don't look at the presenting self. Look at the authentic self of what people will do. Well, and he's also saying be aware of your own yes. presenting self. What are you portraying to the world and what be intentional. Of course, everybody who's been on Instagram is very well of this concept, but... Right. And that's a great point, because uh, especially in, in Florence and in the Republic and all the politics that were going on, there are people who would have been so steeped in all the uh, dishonesty and, and double play that they would have even lost sight they were even doing it anymore. So it becomes an altered reality. So all this to say, in summary, we are indeed, in a sense, princes of sorts. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, inescapably. <laughs> and as such, this book is important to read. <laughs> it is. Well, thanks for listening and being with us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this introduction to a really great classic work that we're excited to be talking about for the next few weeks. Uh, check us out on Instagram. Check us out on Facebook. Check us out on howtolovelitpodcast.com. Thanks for being a part of what we're doing. 
Happy New Year and peace out.